Hello again, this is Rick Pelt Steele. Um, this is part of a video series on improving our writing for legal writing uh, for students, especially doing upper level research papers. And in this uh, video and a couple after it, my intention is to uh, urge you to look at your work at multiple levels of abstraction and thereby seek to improve it. And so we're going to start here at the broadest level, looking at a work in whole. So this is something you can do uh, once you have a, a draft paper, but uh, it's also something you can do if you're at this broad level, if you're just working with an outline, think about what your outline should look like. And bear in mind, uh, as I often say to students in my seminars at the outline level, um, this can change, your outline can change. There's nothing wrong with that. So you need to think about what works and be open to flexibility. Uh, to choose the best strategy for your paper. Uh, but right now I'm going to look at a, a published work. So we're looking back at something that's out there. Um, and I'm going to use one of my own a co authorship. Uh, I'm using this not to say that, that it's good or bad, but only, only just uh, because I'm familiar with it. And if I criticize it, um, all errors are mine. Um, this is co authored with a former student and attorney in Arkansas named Kitty Cohn who's fabulous, and as I say, anything I say negative about this piece is uh, undoubtedly my own contribution and not Kitty's. Um, but it's, uh, it's good for us, it's good to have something to work with. It's a, it's a relatively short piece. Um, it has a very discreet, narrow purpose. So in this sense, I think it's a, akin to what you might be doing in a research paper for a class. Um, this article called FERPA Close-Up on Video Captures Violence and Injury actually grew out of a problem that Kitty was having in practice as an attorney uh, representing families and children. Um, and we wrote this in order to respond to that problem. It fits into a, a genre of legal scholarship we might call advocacy scholarship because our purpose was to uh, effect, if not a change in law, a change in, in the interpretation of law. And uh, that's a permissible purpose in legal uh, scholarship and legal publishing, um, and you know, I, I hope, of course, that we had have had some some favorable impact. But I say all that so that you understand the context for this work and what we're interested in when we're looking at it at the top level is how is this work organized, and is it organized well to achieve uh, what it sets out to do, what its purpose is, which is this advocacy, uh, and and finally, do the parts of the work actually do what we want them to do. And so uh, here we have a table of contents. You might not have a table of contents in a, in a one semester paper, that's perfectly okay. Uh, this is a little longer than a one semester paper would be. Um, so table of contents can be helpful. It has a lot of parts, so it's helpful to readers. Um, but I, I wanted to work with this because we could look at the table of contents so that we can see the headings all in one place and kind of assess what's going on here. So um, you'll see that this is broken down into, and if I scroll down just a little bit now, this paper is broken down into actually six parts. See if I can get them on the screen at once, not quite. Um, but from the top here, we have an introduction, which is quite standard. And if I scroll down, and it won't stop. Scroll down and we have a conclusion at the end. Um, so as I indicated uh, in a previous video, um, what we'd really like to see in a lot of a kind of standard format for, for papers is a kind of hourglass uh, form um, where the introduction starts with some kind of broad concept. It narrows it down into what this paper is trying to accomplish and then uh, toward the end of the paper, perhaps at the end of the analysis or just in a brief conclusion, it pushes things back out to that broad level. And we want to see a little bit of symmetry between what's being talked about here and what's being talked about here um, so, that, so that the paper uh, sort of takes a reader on this journey into the narrow niche topic that it's dealing with and then pulls back out to the implications of what the reader has learned with us. So we'll see if this paper uh, achieves that. Um, 
we have multiple parts in the middle. Certainly, there's there's no set one way to do a work of legal scholarship. Um, you need to you have the sort of freedom to organize it in a way that it works that is functional. Um, that's uh, somewhat liberating if you've done work in more rigid uh, hard science or social sciences. Um, but but we do sort of want to make sure that we don't abuse that freedom. We need our organizational structure to accomplish what it sets out to do. Um, part two here, and we were being a little cute in our titles, but FERPA by design protecting student privacy, and then FERPA upside down uh, protecting educational institutions rather than students. Uh, what these two sections achieve together, um, they're both what we might call background. Sorry, I can't write with uh, annotations in PDF, but these are, these are background on FERPA. And the FERPA by design section, I can't make the box go away. Whoops, made everything go away. So with the FERPA by design and FERPA upside down sections, um, we're achieving background in two different ways. It was important to me and Kitty to do this. The FERPA by design is what FERPA is supposed to do. So we're looking at the text of the law and its statutory, uh, pardon me, its legislative history. And then FERPA upside down, we're using empirical data, we're using case law uh, and, and some administrative regulations and related primary source material to show that FERPA is not functioning the way it should. So we're showing the law as it's supposed to be and the law as it's functioning, but both those together form a legal background. In, in parts four and five, we're getting into our specific problem, which is video surveillance and FERPA. In, in part four, we're really talking about uh, FERPA, and by the way, that's the Family Educational uh, Rights and Privacy Act, which is a, 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 a privacy statute um, in the uh, educational context for K-12 and higher ed. Um, in, in here, we're talking about FERPA and video surveillance and the different contexts in which that problem has arisen. Um, in part five, we're really talking about, uh, again, I can't write it, but FOI, that's what I'm trying to write, FOI, Freedom of Information and Access to Video Surveillance. So there's sort of the, the privacy component about video surveillance, and then the access component about video surveillance. Now, if I can scroll down into that part five, you'll see over here, um, something a little more uh, discreet, or pardon me, a little more nuanced that's going on. Uh, this part four is functioning something like a rule. If we think about this as an IRAC, our introduction is setting out an issue, and our rule is being expressed uh, through parts, really parts two through four, two and three being the broad background about, about the statute, uh, part four being the rule as to our specific problem on video surveillance. So again, notice the narrowing that's happening. Move me around. Notice the narrowing that's happening from, from uh, broad rule to narrow rule. And then in our narrow rule, which is the problem we're dealing with in this case, here we're, we're really talking about access, but we're also applying that. So this is where we're applying everything we've learned about FERPA, its statutory background, and also its specific experience in the video surveillance area. And now we're going to talk about what the analysis of that should be, what we think it should be. This is analysis slash advocacy. What we think that analysis should be or where the authorities are going wrong. And then we come back around to our conclusion. So, um, I put this up here to indicate that there is something of an IRAC model going on within a legal research paper. Um, it's, not, it's not quite as rigid as we talk about in the context of an appellate brief, but, but the same concept is sound. You've got to get all the materials out there. Uh, you've got to get all the materials out there that you're going to work with later. And then you're going to apply those materials to do uh, what you want to do with them. And in this case, again, that's 
advocacy or to show where things went awry. Now let's, if we get into the paper a little bit, let's see what's going on. And particularly now I wanna look at the introduction and conclusion. So, you know, most papers are going to have an introduction and conclusion. We used a particular style here, which you do not have to use unless somebody tells you they want you to. Uh, we use the style here of telling a story to introduce the problem. Again, a legal research paper for your class doesn't have to do that. It is a compelling way to bring the reader in and explain what the problem is. So, so that's the strategy we took. Uh, we tell this story about a boy named Zach who got hurt and uh, access was needed to his medical records um, and to the records of the school, pardon me, actually to the records of the school on security to figure out how he was how he got hurt so that we could give him the right medical treatment. Sorry, but I misstated that. So there's a little background here on what happened to Zach and how, and then this paragraph relates those facts about what happened to Zach to the problem that arose under federal privacy law. And then we make our pitch. Zach's case is a tragic example of legal error that's become all too common. Educational institutions improper reliance on FERPA. This article focuses on the misuse of FERPA. Okay, so we're transitioning now. Remember, remember we saw this in a previous video. We're transitioning now. We're doing that narrowing. We're going from this broad uh, policy problem and we're narrowing that to a very narrow problem of FERPA interpretation. If I go on now to the next page, let me bring it down just a little bit to the end of the introduction. Uh, here we have a roadmap, and you know that I'm a fan of roadmaps. I love a roadmap. This article begins in part two. Uh, part three explains, part four examines, part five then demonstrates, and then part six concludes. So when we get into it, now we can just look at again at a big picture level here. We jump into part two. We're told by uh, the roadmap that part two would briefly explore FERPA's history. We jump into part two. FERPA was signed into law by President Ford in 1974. Okay, so indeed we're starting right at the beginning of the history. Now I do like signposting. There's not really a good signpost at the beginning of this part two. Uh, you might remember that happening when we looked at a work uh, in a previous work of mine in a previous video. You can tell that if I feel like you're coming off the roadmap, you should know what this is about. And I'm kind of inclined to dive right into that history. Uh, but signposts are great and you can't have enough of them. Let's scroll forward just a little bit. Uh, look at part three. Uh, FERPA upside down, again, looking at the, the misinterpretation of FERPA, but still in the background. Despite the best intentions of FERPA's drafters to create a law to protect the privacy of children, FERPA has become a go-to device to shield information against access. All right, so again, we're transitioning from despite the legislative history you just read about, this is misused. And that has got to be, we want this as a thesis sentence to this entire part three, we want this sentence to, to tell us what this part is about. And that we want that signpost, that sign, that's a terrible drawing of a signpost, we want that signpost to be consistent with what the table of contents told us, what the roadmap told us, and then we want it to be a summary of, kind, of a kind for this entire section three. Let's go forward and look at section four, see how we did. FERPA close up. We're now, again, narrowing to our specific problem of video surveillance, the niche thing that Kitty and I are interested in. The DOE charges the FPCO with enforcement of FERPA, relating to educational institutions. In recent years, much confusion has arisen from proliferation of electronic media. Um, okay, I'll tell you the truth. It's not awesome. I think I could have done better. Um, and you know, this is what you discover when you look at your own work, so be warned. Uh, I would rather have seen a sentence that nicely transitioned from uh, the letter of the law to the reality of the law which is what this part four is supposed to accomplish. Um, I think we'll find, if I can scroll it down just a little bit more in part four, I think we'll find that this top section does that in whole. So again, this top section 
um, you'll see talks about it starts off talking about um, what how FERPA enforcement works and who is responsible for making these rules we just read about. And then the second paragraph, again with one of these uh, despite clauses, is going to talk about how they're not doing their job. And so there's a problem. Uh, a, a review of the legal issues that arise in cases of accidental injury on campus reveals the thin grounds on which disclosure is refused. Um, and so we, what we have here is an introductory part of this, uh, a rather an introductory two paragraphs um, for this part four of the paper. And overall, they do their job above letter A. That is above letter A, what I want is not substantive content, but a signpost to tell the reader this is what part four is doing. And the, the overall gist of those two paragraphs is to do that. I do think the first paragraph could have used a stronger introductory sentence or a clearer one, but, but we've got the job done at the top of this part four. Um, let's go on and look at part five. I can get to it. Part five, and of course we could do this, by the way, we could do this uh, at the next level with our parts, with our subparts, right? So we should have a roadmap at the top of part four and everything within part four should follow the roadmap. And we want clear thesis sentences at the top of each of our subparts. Oh, we're getting there. All right, part, what, where are we? Part five, access to video surveillance. So now we're in part five. And this is where we're looking at access to video surveillance. Uh, but and we're going to so apply what we've learned. So up here, we've been talking about how FERPA is dysfunctional. We've gone from its broad background, its broad background, and we've come into its dysfunction. Now we're going to apply that uh, and talk about the uh, reasons. And here, of course, we're talking really advocacy that Kitty and I are up to. The reasons why in our analysis slash advocacy, uh, this, this is the correct interpretation of FERPA. This is how FERPA and everything you've read should be applied to the circumstances that we're talking about, the problem we're talking about. Notice that we start considering Zach's case discussed in part one. And that's because just like in an appellate brief, when you come to the argument, we're now turning to the facts of this case. Uh, in the terms of legal scholarship, we're turning back to the problem that we presented on a factual predicate for this article. Uh, we're referring back to part one. We have the family of an injured child that needs to access video surveillance. And so this problem uh, points us to uh, the same conclusion, disclosure, right? So this is a nice, neat, concise paragraph that tells us what part five is about. It's consistent with the roadmap and it sets out a thesis of a, of a kind for this entire part five above part A. In other words, it's a part five signpost. Okay, and it relates those earlier facts to the law because that's what this whole section is going to do. It's going to take uh, the law that we've, that we've been exploring, it's going to relate it to the problem, and it's going to advocate for or analyze our way uh, toward the conclusion. All right, so that's part five. Let's take a look at that conclusion. All the way down, all the way down. All right, here we have conclusion. You notice that we, again, we're being cute, but we're also framing the conclusion with our facts, Zach attack, the video in Zach's case. This conclusion is hearkening back to the introduction, right? So remember what we're doing. We've got, it doesn't want to draw on two pages. Uh, we've got our hourglass design, our introduction. We want to back it out now to the conclusion. Uh, we want symmetry from introduction to conclusion uh, related to our problem in public policy that here has a factual predicate. Um, we're reminding the reader about the facts in the Zach case 
And actually we're supplementing that a little bit now because we're giving an epilogue about what happened in Zach's case uh, in, at the end of it. Um, we say, in fact, starting off Zach's case, was the video was ultimately released by court order, but almost a month after the accident. And, and so we update the factual predicate. The next paragraph is about policy guidance is urgently needed. This is our conclusion, right? Notice that we are, we're backing it out, we're backing it out from the niche problem, getting toward policy. All right, let's go down to the very end. We have a third conclusion paragraph, and your conclusion does not have to be this long, but this has been a long article. Uh, general video surveillance behind the classroom is inherently law enforcement, not educational. FERPA affords schools uh, ample latitude. FERPA uh, should never be used to forestall justice. I mean, you can't get much more public policy than justice. So again, we've, we've backed it out to the broadest framework, which is justice. And so we have a design, I hope, that serves the purposes Kitty and I set out to do. We have a, have a roadmap, and we have an article that makes good on what that roadmap promise to do. Okay, in subsequent videos, we're going to dig in a little deeper on this and a couple other works and look at some exercises uh, that you can use to examine your work at a closer perspective. Thank you.